All right. So, um, yeah, so Tim talked about, you know, uh, following a hard act to follow, you know, so like I kind of feel like it's like one step down, you know, it's just like we had, we had uh, three excellent medical talks and I'm not going to talk about any medical data whatsoever. Um, but uh, my justification is it's also going to be short. Uh, so that we only have, uh, have as much uh, stuff to worry about. Um, so some of you who know me know that I think about epistemology a lot. Epistemology is how do we know anything and how do we make decisions based on what we know. And so this is mostly about that, but with a moral dimension I added, and I'll have some specifically moral considerations uh, uh, to talk about at the end. So, okay, good, this is working. So um, I would say that most of the really thorny debates that we have um, really come down to this basic question of how do you make decisions uh, with only partial information. So I think there's not anybody who would say, if we were absolutely sure that uh, global warming is happening and we're absolutely sure that by changing you know, various things in the uh, you know, coal industry or whatever, that we would stop it, then everybody would be on board, right? So the debate is oftentimes about, uh, well, how do you really know? Uh, are you really sure uh, in all of this? Um, we've also, of course, been talking about vaccines. Uh, going all the way back to the 80s and even the 70s, uh, Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, uh, is the danger of uh, radiation something? Should we, should we ban nuclear radiation or is it reasonable uh, to have that? Uh, we've seen more recently uh, debate about, you know, what is a person? What is, a, what is a, a, an identity? You know, uh, you know, how sure are we? If somebody says, well, a psychological study showed this, you know, do we really know for sure that that's, uh, you know, really shown? Um, so I'm not going to talk about any of these issues. I'm just going to talk about, in general, how does one make decisions based on partial information? Uh, so my first point uh, is one that uh, may be sort of obvious, <clears throat> but in general, we're always dealing with incomplete <laughs> information. That every decision that you make at the end of the day comes down to uh, something that is more or less certain. Uh, in general, and this is something I've talked about in other talks, uh, certainty is a continuous variable. You can be very uncertain or you can be very certain uh, and uh, anywhere in between. Uh, on the other hand, uh, actions tend to have to be discontinuous. Like, so I either get in the car and go to the store or I don't. Uh, you know, so I may be uh, somewhat uh, uncertain about uh, whether they will have the item that I want to go buy, uh, but I have to either decide I'm getting in the car to go or I'm not. Uh, and so we typically talk about a threshold of certainty <clears throat> in which we say, well, um, when I know enough to act, then I will actually do it. And I, uh, uh, I think there's an analogy of this uh, with faith, actually, that some people get very hung up on you know, do I absolutely know that God exists? Do I absolutely know these things? And the answer is, well, you don't know anything, absolutely. Uh, but you can be, uh, you can know enough to act. You can know enough to take a step of faith. Uh, and, you know, even in a non-religious sphere, uh, you could have an engineer who designs a bridge, cannot prove with absolute certainty that that bridge will not fall down, but can have enough certainty to walk across the bridge. Right, and say, I can make a decision. I know enough to be confident it won't fall down the first time I walk on it. Um, so the question, therefore, is never, when will I know perfectly? The question uh, really is, when do I know enough that inaction, uh, which I can define as acting that I don't know it, would itself be immoral? So there can, uh, my argument is going to be, there can come a time, even with partial information, that we can say, you know enough that it would actually be wrong to pretend you don't know uh, or to act as though you didn't know. Uh, and so um, there's going to be uncertainties in how you make that decision, uh, as well as in the knowledge itself. So let me give you some examples here. Um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, here's my first uh, argument here. Um, and this is not new to me at all. This is uh, out uh, in a lot of places. Uh, the demand for action is proportional to the product of two things. Uh, one is the probability that your information is correct. Uh, and the second is the consequences of not acting on that information. 
Okay, so it'd be helpful, I think, with some examples. Okay, so you have a friend who you know to be generally untrustworthy, uh, and they say, I had a vision that Martians are about to invade Earth. All right, so with this metric here, um, the probability that the person is telling the truth is very low. On the other hand, the consequences are very high. So you're multiplying a very small number times a very large number, and you might say, well, how do I know? But it's possible that uh, even though the consequences are very high, the probability you assign is so low that it still outweighs the consequences of Martian behaving, right? <laughs> so you still come up with, uh, I don't need to act on this, uh, because uh, even though the consequences are high, the probability is very, very low uh, in this case. Um, on the other hand, uh, how about this one? Uh, someone who you generally trust says you left your hat at my house. Um, well, it's probably very high probability that the friend uh, is telling the truth. Uh, on the other hand, losing a hat is not like Martians invading. You know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and so you might decide not to drive over there and get the hat, right? Because you might say, well, high probability but low consequences. And the product of the two still comes out low, right? Because you don't really care about the hat, right? Um, let's go on. Uh, this one I think is very relevant to the topic we've had. Um, you're driving a car on a foggy night, uh, and uh, the passenger, the person in the passenger seat says, I think up ahead, I see someone walking down the middle of the road, but I'm not sure. I just see a vague outline. Um, okay. Um, the probability of it being true uh, is, is low to medium, right? So you don't absolutely know there's a person there, okay? On the other hand, the consequences of hitting a person in the middle of the road are very, very high, right? And so morally, if you say, well, I don't absolutely know there's a person there, so you step on the gas, you're acting immorally, right? So uh, you, you say that the potential consequences uh, and the reasonable probability, it's not crazy that somebody might be walking in the middle of a foggy road in the middle of the night. So that probability is not terribly low and the consequences are very high. So in this case, you would actually say somebody who ignored the passenger and stepped on the gas and drove straight would actually be acting immorally, right? Acting as though, and even though they only have partial information and it's not at all sure that there really is somebody in the road, to not pull aside or at least slow down and look very carefully to take action would actually be uh, immoral. Um, so the, the complexity of this is that different people might have different thresholds. So I said it's the product of these two, but I didn't give you an absolute number to say at what is the, what's the exact number at which you say, okay, this product now exceeds my threshold and I need to act. Um, that could be different for different people, but the Bible tells us there nevertheless is a threshold which you should not cross. Uh, so some person might be very, very cautious. And, and say, even if it's a relatively low bar, you know, uh, maybe, you know, take some anti-Martian precautions just, you know, to be on the safe side. Um, other people might have a higher bar, uh, but um, uh, as we saw this morning, for instance, the verse about putting a fence around your roof in a culture where people walk on roofs, um, you know, you're saying, well, it's unlikely somebody would fall off my roof, but it's not impossible. Uh, and the consequences are very grave, so... Uh, I will put a fence around my roof, right? Um, the Bible in general tells us that if you set that bar infinitely high uh, on your favorite issue, then you are hard-hearted and you're acting immorally. Uh, and so, of course, the classic example is, you know, someone could say, um, well, that was 10 very impressive plagues, Moses, but I, I need some more information. I need more evidence uh, before I really believe that God is with you. <laughs> uh, and it did not fly with God as an argument, right? And he said, you have plenty of evidence. You have more than enough to know. And now you're just being hard-hearted. Uh, and so that can be the case where people can, can be um, hard-hearted against the truth because of internal bias uh, reasons. And that is, uh, biblically speaking, uh, they're then uh, moving into the area of being immoral and claiming impartial knowledge or imperfect knowledge is not sufficient to justify going against uh, uh, what uh, you might have to do. Um, another complexity of this is that uh, both of these numbers can change over time. The longer you go, you might get more information, right? So as you continue, so for instance with global warming, 
uh, they're continuing to take data. So we have better data now than we did in the 80s. And so what might have been a wise decision in the 80s might not be a wise decision now. We also have more information about consequences. So we might say, well, we've done studies and we found that actually if the Earth gets five degrees warmer, it's no big deal. Uh, and so we'll be fine. Uh, and so your, your conclusions about this can change over time. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, what was moral for you to do last year might not be moral this year based on new information. Uh, and so that is uh, something that uh, we have to take into account. So uh, wait and see often is a wise initial approach, uh, but remaining in decision forever is not always wise and can actually be foolish. Uh, sometimes you need to take an action uh, or uh, because of you know, your information now becoming more clear. Uh, okay, so my second point, I think I only have four of these, so uh, we're doing pretty well on time here. Uh, the con and so we did hear about this this morning. The consequences of an action almost always require cost-benefit analysis. In other words, every action usually uh, has both negative and positive things that can come from it. Uh, and again, your assessment of what could happen is based on impartial knowledge, right? So you're assessing it might be uh, good or it might not, but in general, you're adding up costs and benefits. We heard about that uh, in previous talks. Um, so an example of this is uh, one that actually I remember out in California, I heard it was a real, it was a real political issue at one point. Um, how much arsenic should we allow in our water supply? Uh, well, you would think the answer is none. Why should we allow any arsenic in our water? That's terrible. Uh, will poison people. Um, but of course, you know, there's very, very little and there's absolutely none, right? And scientifically, to literally get rid of every single arsenic atom in that water is enormously expensive. You kind of have to put it in a nuclear centrifuge uh, in order to get every last arsenic out. Uh, and so that means if you want the water supply to be absolutely free of arsenic, you're going to have to run the entire water supply through nuclear centrifuges, which use a power grid the size of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, you know, to get rid of every last arsenic atom. Uh, and that would then cost enormous amounts of money, uh, which might have gone to something else that would save people much more directly. Right. So oftentimes uh, it can sound very good to say we should have a zero threshold, you know, that if it's risky, we must absolutely get rid of it. Uh, but it's sort of like with the driving uh, analogy that we were talking about earlier. Um, you can get to a point where you say the risk of this is low enough that tolerating some is okay. Uh, and the cost of actually removing all risk is worse than uh, what the potential savings is. Um, so, uh, for instance, as, you know, as a principle here, you know, sometimes you're here in the public sphere, uh, the cost of one human life is never too high. Um, it sounds good, but it can fail the cost-benefit uh, tests. Um, so, you know, it sounds very hard-hearted, and I think I have a comment here. Uh, political reality is that if, if you engage in cost-benefit analysis, it always sounds cold and uncaring, right? So, you know, somebody says, well, if we spent a trillion dollars, we could prevent this one condition that stops one baby from dying next year. And you say, well, that's just not worth it. You know, you're open to the to the criticism. You don't care about babies. I mean, you're setting a price on that baby's head and saying that there's a cost you will not go above in order to save this one life. Why you should spend a trillion dollars to save that one baby's life? Uh, the problem is, if you spend a trillion dollars, you're not spending it on something else, which might have been food for many other babies, right? And so, again, you have to weigh things against each other, and oftentimes you can say. Um, it sounds hard-hearted, but letting some people die of this could actually be more moral than spending enormous resources for a relatively small problem. Uh, and that is, um, unfortunately, very hard argument to make in the public sphere, uh, because it always sounds like you're just saying, let them drink arsenic. <laughs> you know, uh, it always sounds like you're uncaring about, about risks uh, when you really, uh, the, the rational thing would be to compare relative risks and costs and benefits. Um, so in general, I would say in uh, our internet world, one of the problems in the public sphere 
is that we live in a world in which statistically insignificant consequences are often amplified. You can read mm -hmm. about, you know, one shooting in Florida in the past year, or you can read about uh, one person who died of a vaccine or something like that. Uh, and it, it, we don't have a sense of perspective. Um, there's been, I believe, studies, although don't, don't hold me to this, uh, but I, you know, my experience is people really can't grasp a number larger than 10. Uh, we generally think one, two, three, 10 large. Uh, and so, you know, saying to somebody, uh, the odds of this are one in a million, and the odds of this are one in a billion, sound roughly the same. Uh, and mentally, I don't think that we can actually really grasp the, the difference of those numbers. And so we tend to compress the really big risks, and we tend to magnify the small things that are right in front of us in our face on a, in an image uh, on the internet. Uh, and so uh, it becomes very hard for us to apply a rational cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and it's exacerbated by the fact that journalists and bloggers make money by sensationalizing dangers. And I, uh, we've talked about this at past meetings. Um, I don't know that we've really talked about this meeting. You know, there is sometimes level the accusation. Um, oh, you're working for big pharma, or you're working for this company, or you know, there's a profit motive here. So uh, clearly, you would be biased. But what never seems to be questioned is. Do you think that journalists and bloggers are not concerned about money? <laughs> you know, like, uh, in fact, they also have a profit motive because the more hits they get, the more they can sell their ads. Uh, on the internet, <clears throat> you have a direct one for one. Every time somebody clicks on your site, you get a penny from the advertiser uh, or whatever it is. Uh, if you're a big site, maybe a dime or something like that. Uh, and so the more hits you get is directly money in your pocket uh, on, these, on these blogs. Uh, and as um, Tim was mentioning, for some people, it doesn't even need to be money. Just being famous is good enough for a lot of people, right? If I wrote a blog and it got a million hits, like that just makes me feel really good. And so everybody has a conflict of interest. Uh, you know, as Tim was saying, we live in a world in which people are sinful. And so it's not to say there isn't any bias on the industrial academic complex. But also there's bias on the other side of the people who are writing sensational blogs and sensational news stories also have a profit motive to uh, sensationalize things and to play up things that might otherwise be statistically uh, unimportant. Okay, so here, now I'm moving out of sort of the realm of uh, numbers, you might say, and into just pure moral statements. But this affects, I would say, how we act, where we set that threshold. Uh, where we bias toward action or inaction. Um, and this was already mentioned, um, I believe, by Greg uh, in the first talk. In general, I would argue biblically, we should have a bias toward corporate action, which needs often to be deference to authorities. That is a very controversial thing to say in our day, because we live in a culture in which we hate that. Uh, but let's not forget, civilization could be defined as the product of people working together to do things that they individually could not do. Uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, you need to have an authority structure. You cannot make a train grid with a lot of railroads without somebody organizing that endeavor. Whether it's the government or whether it's an industrial hierarchy, there's going to be a plan and people implementing that and a lot of people taking orders in order to build train tracks uh, and to build trains. Uh, and if you don't uh, do that, you don't have a train system, and civilization starts to break down. Um, so um, the political reality, of course, is we're all rebels at heart. It's not on one side of the aisle or the other. Every one of us hates to be told what to do, and we all want to be the ones to tell other people what to do. Um, uh, and that's always been, and I don't think that's going to change. Um, so one of the uh, arguments that sometimes people make is, well, but we know that tyrannies exist. Right? So we know examples of oppressive authority. So if we're biased toward deference to authorities, uh, and Greg mentioned this as well, um, is this just the first step of a slippery slope toward a dictatorship? Um, and um, uh, even at a much lower level, we've seen individual churches collapse because of abuses by authorities uh, covering up things uh, or what have you. Um, so actually, I'm going to apply rule number one which is you have to, again, 
multiply the probabilities here and say, what is the probability that this particular authority is lying or unjust versus the uh, cost of disobedience and uh, entering uh, one step closer to anarchy? Uh, and what seems to me is often neglected is that people don't count. Anarchy has a cost, right? In this cost-benefit analysis, anarchy, the collapse of society, is a real tangible cost, right? So if you say every one of us wants to do what's right in our own eyes, have you counted the cost of what anarchy looks like? Uh, and that is a cost to be weighed against the cost of giving too much power to government and possibly giving a tyranny. Uh, and so you have to sort of make a similar kind of calculation and say, for this particular case, uh, is this so risky that this is going to turn into a tyranny that it deserves the risk of anarchy? Uh, you know, and, uh, and so you might make that different in different issues. So you might say, well, I'm willing to do the vaccine, but I'm not willing to give up my guns. Or you, know, you might judge differently on different uh, issues uh, in regard to this. Uh, but in general, I, I think that oftentimes people don't count the cost of anarchy. Uh, we just seem to think that everything's going to run normally, no matter what, because we've had a very successful authority structure for 200 and some years, and we don't count the cost of what real anarchy looks like. But if you go to some countries of the world where truly in anarchy, it's a disaster, uh, and there's deaths that are associated with anarchy. When you can't, if you're in a country where you can't trust that anybody will follow the rules, that's, that's not a good place to be. You know, that is a place of, of anarchy, and there are many places in the world that are, that are like that. Um, so I'm going to give you an example uh, from history. Um, this is a, sometimes called the Perfect War. Um, in the 1600s, uh, many of you are familiar with this, a, a great back-and-forth struggle, uh, first against the Catholic Church, and then uh, with the king abolishing the parliament, and so on. Uh, and uh, toward the end, uh, they were all pretty much Protestant of one type or another. The Catholics were not running things. Uh, and the English government decided to create a rule uh, that all church worship had to use a common book of common prayer. Uh, everyone had to use the same book. And they're very worried, actually, about illiterate uh, pastors, so just anybody claiming themselves to be a pastor. And their concern was that if you give everybody freedom of religion, then you'll have really weird cults. You know, not a completely ungrounded worry, right? <laughs> um, but uh, their solution to that was to create a, a book of common prayer. Uh, and uh, a significant number of people, many in Scotland, some in England, uh, felt on principle uh, that they, the government had no right to make that rule. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, the book is fine. I mean, most Protestants today... I would say probably 95% of Protestants in America would agree with 95% of the Book of Common Prayer. Um, it's not a highly controversial book, but for the people at the time, it wasn't about what was in the book. It was the principle of the thing that the government, how dare the government tell us uh, what we can do. Now, on the one hand, they had a much more near experience of a real tyranny, where you know Bloody Mary was literally killing off thousands of people. And so... You know, their fear of a real tyranny was not unfounded. Uh, and yet, you could say, this particular case, it's, it's a prayer book, it's a fine prayer book. Um, and so the upshot was, they went to war over this book. Uh, at least that was how it was perceived in the public eye. Thousands of people died, and no matter how you want to slice it, it was two groups of evangelical Protestants killing each other over a dispute about whether to use a particular book of prayer. Uh, and it discredited conservative Christianity for hundreds of years in England. Uh, that if you read Jonathan Swift, you know, uh, the big Indians and the uh, little Indians and so on, that's what he's talking about. Um, and, he's, and he was not alone. There's many people who felt that the uh, very conservative Christians were just nuts uh, because they had no sense of perspective. Uh, and so one could argue, which side should have conceded? Well, could they have met in the middle? You know, it's hard to replay history. But, the, you know, the idea of saying that absolutely the government has no right to do X, Y, or Z, and I'm willing to have people die over this, is a very consequential thing to say. Uh, and you have to really weigh the costs and the benefits. Say, is this particular issue worth 10,000 deaths or 100,000 deaths to ensure that we don't have a dictatorship? 
maybe you would say in the 1600s, some of the wars early on were justified and then later ones weren't. Uh, you can, you, you know, it's not like you have to be totally anti-war or totally pro-war. You know, you could say, I would have been with them on this war and I would have not been with them on that war. I mean, that's a possible ethical decision that you could make. Um, and so I call it sort of sanctified cost uh, benefit analysis. Uh, and I think we talked over lunch about this. Uh, one of the issues for a lot of people was the restriction on in-person worship uh, and the what was perceived as an encroaching into uh, religious freedom. Uh, and um, I care a lot about worship, and I think it's a very important thing. And I would not want to just cede it all over to the government. But like the Book of Common Prayer rule, you have to say, well, is there somewhere to meet in the middle here? <laughs> you know, like before we just start uh, blowing off the government. Uh, and doing uh, everything just the way we see fit. Um, the political reality on this is that compromise and centrism always seem weak, and extremism always seems more strong and virtuous. You know, it's hard to say to a young 20-something, uh, you, know, uh, you should not be extreme. You should, you should try to be a compromiser. <laughs> you know, it just it sounds like an old guy you know, talking to young people, saying, you know, uh, but Oftentimes, um, not being extreme is the most wise position. Okay, this is my last uh, point then, uh, and this has also been mentioned uh, this morning by Greg. Um, in general, if we're hovering on the edge of one of these probability decisions, our bias should be toward restricting our own freedom to reassure others. And I have a couple quotes of Paul here. Um, why not rather be wrong, suffer wrong, and why not rather be defrauded than to harm your brother? Uh, and um, he also explicitly says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So even if you believe masks are completely useless, uh, I would say, you know, Romans 15, 1 says, unless there is clear harm to you for wearing the mask, then you should defer to wearing the mask to make your brother, your weaker brother, uh, you are the strong one who is strong against COVID, but you should bear with your weaker brother uh, in cases where uh, that will encourage them. Um, so I use this as an example. Um, <laughs> suppose you have a small child and you're putting them to bed uh, and they say, check to make sure there are no monsters in the closet. Um, and you're tired, you want to go to bed, you suspect this might be a delaying tactic. Um, <laughs> So, you know, the probability of there actually being a monster in the closet is low. Um, on the other hand, uh, the cost of checking is also low, <laughs> right? And so I might say, for the sake of my brother's conscience, I will check the closet because it does very little harm to me and it makes them feel better, right? Uh, and so sometimes we can do things uh, that on our own. So if I sat down and gave a lecture to my child and said, Look, there's no reason to expect monsters in the closet. Uh, you're being immature. It, it, it would be actually much easier to just go and check and make the child happy, right? Um, so sometimes, uh, again, I can do something at low cost to myself if I perceive that it will be a benefit to my brother or sister. Um, so um, I lied. That wasn't my final point. Um, I have a list of just a few thoughts about how to build trust. Uh, we were talking about this uh, on the web the other day. Um, interestingly, the rate of vaccination in Western Europe is high, higher than the US. The rate of vaccination in Eastern Europe is low, lower than the United States. Why the difference? Well, if you have know people in Eastern Europe, they have a long history of untrustworthy governments, of governments uh, which are you know, communist uh, or just outright corrupt. Uh, and so on, and so there's a general distrust of government. And so our options, uh, if we're in Eastern Europe, so to speak, uh, but also in the US, uh, where at any given point in time, half the people don't trust the government, right? So whichever way it flips, the other half will not trust the government. Um, so we could just rebuke the masses for not trusting us. It's unlikely to uh, bear fruit. Um, that's a strategy that's been tried. Um, we could try to gain control of all information so they have to trust us. They have no other information. The internet makes that very, very hard at this point. That used to be a strategy many governments used. Just control all of information. Uh, that is almost impossible these days. Even in China, 
they're trying it, but the information gets in, uh, and uh, people have VPNs and so on. Uh, and the third option is to actually try to do things to build trust, uh, to convey uh, to people your reasoning why these things are good uh, and, and worth doing, uh, and build their trust in that. And so along these lines, um, we've talked about this a little bit at this meeting. Um, I don't know that a lot of scientists appreciate how damaged the reputation of science is by the last couple of years of major retractions. Like saying that you cannot go to a football game because you'll spread COVID, but you can go to a riot, mm -hmm. that's okay, it was incredibly damaging uh, for the reputation of science. Uh, and you know whether or not you think it, the cost benefit is okay, it destroyed uh, the credibility uh, for a lot of people. Um, uh, in general, arrogance and dogmatism, um, the statement, believe science, offends me as a scientist. It's basically saying science is dogma. Uh, and we just have a whole meeting about how science changes and our information grows and changes over time. Uh, and so we shouldn't use things like that. And even there was a I think it was Spalsky who said, I am the science. Uh, if you disagree with me, you are disagreeing with the science. Um, there also has been damage done uh, because of, uh, you know, famous examples of, uh, for instance, the study is on tobacco being suppressed and so on. Uh, interestingly, over lunch, uh, I didn't know this. Uh, in the 90s, I had several doctor friends who told me about all of the benefits that uh, pharmaceutical companies would give to them, money, trips to Bahamas, and I was told that stopped that there was an internal uh, sort of arrangement that they don't do that anymore. So there is self-correction uh, in the system. Um, so I would say one of the things we should be willing to do to respect the public uh, is to tell them scientific recommendations change and not say, believe the science dogmatically, it never changes, but to say, yes, we do change. And so at any point in time, we're saying, Right now, this seems to us the best, wisest thing to do, given the information that we have right now. Uh, please trust us to do this, because we really think the data is good, but we can't promise you that it's absolute, and it might be next year that we have to change our story. Allow them to see how science works. You know, tell them on benefit, you know, like the cost benefit, we believe the benefits far outweigh the cost of this, but we're not going to pretend there are no costs. And it's interesting, in the lead up to this meeting, just talking to people in my church who are advertising the church, numerous, not, not numerous, anecdotal story, right? Yeah. So two or three people in my church uh, in the last couple of weeks said to me something to the effect of um, they asserted X, Y, or Z with huge dogmatism, and then they reversed it. Uh, and that just, you know, I don't trust them at all anymore. Uh, and so... Um, I think we have to really be willing to say, you know, it's not dog right. It's like, we're just saying to you right now, this is the wisest course based on the information that we have. And it could change, but we trust you to understand that we don't know everything perfectly. Um, and then also, we were talking about this over lunch. Um, I think actually, you know, one of the stories that we have, you know, there's the famous stories of, the companies pushing infant formula for people who didn't need it or uh, suppressing studies on tobacco. The fact that you know about those stories and the fact that they aren't happening is actually an evidence of self-correction in the system, right? That um, there are many lawsuits that have been uh, filed, and Jonathan was talking about there are lawsuits ongoing, that prevent exactly that kind of thing and make it much harder now than it used to be. Uh, and so there is self-correction in the system. And you know you could turn that around and say, what are the self-correction systems for bloggers? You know, like so, what you know, if a blogger posts a story that's outright fraud, you know, what are the checks and balances for self-correction for that person? Uh, does they have an accountability network? We heard about medical companies have layer upon layer of regulators and reviewers and all kinds of things going on. How many layers of checkers are checking the blogs that you're reading? Uh, uh, even sympathetic people, you don't have to have the enemy check them. You know, are there is there anybody who is like-minded who is checking the facts on these things? Uh, and are there consequences to this person if they if they post something false? Uh, and I think we don't pay enough attention to that. 
Uh, so that is uh, what I'll finish with. Uh, and um, I'll just take a couple questions because we're going to move into the panel discussion. So some of the questions could just sort of roll over into the whole panel. So I'll just take like one or two questions uh, right now, if there are any. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jason, I'll show your hand up. Yeah, so thank you for actually trying to get some like, to raise questions <laughs> that I need everybody to figure it out. So I appreciate that. Um, explaining to the public that scientific recommendations are changed. Yes. Um, are we as evangelical Christians partially responsible for making this possible? Here's what I mean. Many Christians have problems with a lot or all of Darwinism or theories of evolution or evolutionary theory in general. And so one of the arguments against it is, ah, look at this contradiction here. Look how he changed his mind. Look how this is developed and hasn't been the same. And so the, those defending those views have to take a retrenchment position. And so they can't reveal any kind of weakness or uncertainty or contingency mm -hmm. on anything. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes impossible to do the kind of thing that you're saying because we made it impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to summarize that, uh, how does the creation evolution issue roll into this? And I think very much. Uh, so uh, I would say it's actually both sides, right? So that on the one hand, um, for you know whatever political or perceived reasons, people who are evolutionists feel, as Jason was saying, they can't admit any, any equivocating data. You know, it all has to be believed, science, evolution is true. We can't even define necessarily what we mean by evolution, but whatever it is, it's true. You know? uh, and on the other hand, you have creationists who are, you know, imagining a vast conspiracy of fabrication of data all around the world and so on. And I think that's a really good example because, you know, we've had meetings on intelligent design, like the truth is somewhere in the middle. Like, so there are many things that you can say are really well established and many other things you can say it looks worse and worse for Darwinism the longer you go because that's just can't do that and so on. So in some sense, the creationists, the hard sort of the hard um, anti-evolution creationists and the evolutionists play off each other and both sort of raise the uh, arms race of, of dogmatism, you know, of saying there's not one chink in our armor, you know. And this society has many times said, no, there's plenty of evidence for this one, but there's not evidence for that. And I think we need to trust the public to say that. And But I agree. I think for many people, I think I said this in Virginia, you know, they're being told believe science. And they're saying at the same time, science is telling you that that baby in the womb is not a baby. You know, it's not human. And that man uh, is, is a woman, not a man. Uh, and that... Beautiful eye is not designed, it's just random. You know, and so they feel like they're being told, don't believe, you know, believe two plus two is five. You know, that things that seem obvious do not believe. Um, and, um, and so that discredits science in a lot of people's minds, uh, you know, including the evolution uh, issue. And I think that humility on both sides to say, good point there, weak point here, you know, is, is what we should be doing. All right, I'll just take one more and then we'll go to the panel discussion. Yeah, Jeremy. And something that you didn't mention yet, and it ties into my comment then, is that where I think a lot of the credibility, this is a comment that I'd like you to comment on. A lot of the distrust, credibility, lack of credibility emerges is actually not in. Uh, is the number from the RCT complete number? It is in, uh, okay, from there, is it wise, prudent, uh, or right that the government adopts uh, this mandate policy. acts? Yeah. Um, so the examples that you gave regarding is a panel woman, uh, that's actually where we've gone beyond, the science has gone beyond a purely descriptive exercise and actually made certain commitments that are far more philosophical um, and then passed it off as if it were the first. Right. And people say, wait, there's been a bait and switch here. So when Fauci says, 
well, you know, these treatments are effective or masking is effective, and then says, therefore, it is good, wise government policy to, at the federal level, create a mask mandate. He suddenly made a huge jump using the, the armor of science, but now he has actually is now out of the purely descriptive science and is into the realm of how do you trade off uh, liberty and health, or how do you deal with imperfect information? Maybe it's wise that we have 50 different state experiments happen. Well, he suddenly just bypassed that whole discussion and used the club of what the RCT said yeah, right. to, to push a particular policy. Yeah, so I'm not going to summarize everything for the internet that Jamie said. It was a comment, but uh, in general, uh, I'll just sort of summarize this way that um, scientists are in some ways the new priesthood. That, you know, in the uh, end of the year uh, 1400, if a priest said it, it was true. Uh, and again, maybe un you know, not necessarily merited because some of them were corrupt, right? Uh, in our day, uh, if you want you know, to shore up a position, you quote a study uh, or, or you bring a scientist out in a white lab coat to, to say something. Uh, and um, uh, so it's very common, as Jeremy was saying, to move to say, here is something that's very, very short. So, like for instance, in evolution, people say, if you don't believe uh, this thing that I'm talking about evolution, it's the same certainty as Newton's laws of gravity. So you must be doubting gravity. Well, no, it's not. You know, Newton's law is very, very accurately determined to 17 decimal places. You know, this study is not accurate to 17 decimal places. They're not to be, they're not the same. And, it, and if you try to equate them, then you are actually being unscientific because you're overstating the certainty uh, and trying to clothe yourself in the certainty of physics. That happens, it kind of drives physics crazy, I think, because they always use our stuff as the most certain stuff, you know. Um, but anyway, so I think with that, let's break for five minutes and we'll put some chairs up here and we'll have an open discussion.